According to tradition, on October 31, 1517, an Augustinian monk by the name of Martin Luther nailed 95 theses or proposals to the door of Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany. With each pound of the hammer, his act of protest against the Catholic Church sent shockwaves through Europe, leaving theological and political ruptures that remain to this day, 500 years after the start of what became known as the Protestant Reformation. In this AIB Presents, we explore the man Martin Luther, the 16th century context in which he lived, and the words that would change the Western world. Well, you know, it is said that we don't have much to say new about Martin Luther because... Mark Ellingson teaches church history at the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta. He's also the author of Martin Luther's Legacy, Reforming Reformation Theology for the 21st Century. If you get into German and Scandinavian the literature, you'll see and you'll begin to believe it. So everybody's got a Martin Luther, but the thing is, historians try to get us to pick their favorite version of Luther. When I get together with Luther scholars, I like to say, you're all correct. Luther's all those things. He is the first Protestant, but he loved Catholicism. He is a learned man, but he despised the use of reason when reading scripture. He is a man of the Bible, but he also loved tradition. He is a man who taught that we are saved by God's love, but sometimes even talked about works. He's a man who is said to be a political conservative and anti-Jewish, but in fact, other times, he sounds like the forerunner of European social democracy, a political liberal. So who is the real Martin Luther? My book tries to sort that out. And I do it by not just saying, Luther is one of these. No, in fact, he's all. In my mind, I think of it like the ice begins to crack, and then the fissures just go out. And they are continuing uh, uh, to go out uh, from here to there. Lloyd Allen is professor of church history and spiritual formation at the McAfee School of Theology at Mercer University. Uh, it might be worth say, noting that Luther didn't think that he was starting a new church. He never set out to start a new church. He started out to reform the Reformation, the church that he was part of. What he discovered in the process was that he couldn't make peace and, uh, with the church or that he didn't want to make peace. I'm not trying to go just from Luther's perspective, but he did find out that he, that he felt that he had to separate from the papacy, which was the central authority of the church that he was trying to uh, reform. So by separating from the papacy, by not accepting its authority, uh, then that made him an outsider to the church which he had always been part of. And, and so for the rest of his life, he's forming a new way of doing church. The new way of doing church was not without its detractors, powerful ones. Some of Luther's 16th century opponents depicted him as a beast with seven heads. His supporters depicted the Roman Catholic Pope and those who opposed Luther's proposed reforms as deformed farm animals or worse. These images, including Luther's sermons and Bible translations, are among the documents held in the Kessler Reformation Collection at the Pitts Theology Library at the Candler School of Theology at Emory University. Richard Manley Adams, Jr. is interim director. What you see here is, and particularly into the 1520s, the real ramping up of this um, after Luther is excommunicated and there is a kind of real rift between the two. Um, that's when you start to develop some of the, the real extreme uh, things that may shock us now that we don't understand. But I think it's important to recognize that this was a polemical time on both sides. And so while you have uh, these demonic depictions of the Pope, you see the same thing of the reformers, right, from the Catholic side. So it really is um, a period of, of, you know, cartoons and this kind of thing, again, as a way of, uh, for us to understand how, how much was at stake and how heated some of these debates were. It had to do with some moves that the Catholic Church was making in the late Middle Ages. One of the projects that were, under, that were going on in Rome was the building of St. Peter's Cathedral. And of course, it takes a lot of funds to do that. Long before Luther was alive, as a fundraiser 
the Catholic Church began selling indulgences. Now, what's an indulgence? An indulgence is a certificate of forgiveness which functions to erase venial sins, sins that are minor sins. And if you erase those minor sins and you're a Catholic, that means you can get out of purgatory quicker. Now, the Catholic Church had always been issuing these free of charge, or at least if you perform certain works of piety. And to this day, you know, you can still get an indulgence in the Catholic Church. But only in this period of about 100 years, before Luther and during his lifetime, were they sold. Well, the word got out. They were going to start selling indulgences in Germany, in Luther's section of Germany. And Luther said, wait a minute. If we can buy indulgences, that's like saying money buys salvation. It's no longer all about God's love now. It's like bribing God to get that love. Luther was determined to try to stop that from happening in his town of Wittenberg. And that's why he writes these 95 theses. But the thing is, he was a good company man. He sent the theses to his bishop. And it so happens his bishop was the chief indulgence seller in Germany. When the bishop gets the letter, he sends it to the Pope, and we start down the road to all kinds of controversies, eventually culminating in Luther's excommunication. Despite being forced out of the Catholic Church, or because of it, Luther kept writing and preaching. One of the, the main touch points of the conversation of the 16th century, and certainly now, is the conversation of authority. That is, how does one make certain decisions about how one lives one's life? And so, in the 16th century, that became a question of, does the church make this decisions for me? Does the individual reading scripture make the decisions of you? Or can one kind of make decisions apart from physical uh, authorities? And so, this is very much a conversation that's continuing today. And in the 16th century, again, it's, it's a heated argument because, there, again, there is so much at stake in making these decisions things that he brought up, for instance, are priesthood of believer, uh, meaning that uh, there's not a separation between the laity and the clergy uh, in the sense that one is more spiritual than the other. So he, he wrote that uh, a lay person whose calling is to be a shoe cobbler who does that well and does that faithfully uh, is, is just as important in spiritually as a person who becomes a monk or who becomes a priest, uh, which was a radical idea uh, at the time. Well, in the 16th century, there is, of course, what's at stake for individuals, but with the, um, what's somewhat foreign for us in an American context is the, the connections between the church and the state, right? And so decisions made about the church and about how one should live affect how one sets up a governmental structure. It also affects how, what kinds of texts one can read, what kind of lives people can lead, you know, whether there is distribution of income across uh, different, different uh, classes. So it really is a kind of question about society and what kind of society we live in, not simply a religious question. It was a turning of history with the, Re with the Reformation, which has religious roots, but has consequences for a person's whether they're religious or not in our day and time. Uh, uh, for example, we now identify ourselves primarily with the nation state we're a part of. So if you ask me, uh, what country are you? Uh, part of, I would say, the United States. That's my passport. And, but in those days, if you had asked what a citizen are you, what place are you a citizen of, they would have said, I'm part of Christendom, uh, which would have meant, what in, in the territory that today is Western Europe, would have meant that uh, I am a citizen of this social structure of church and state, which we call Christendom, and we call it that because it's the Christian territory. And uh, in the Reformation in, in the 16th century, during that, during that 100 years or 150 years, uh, that broke down and fractured. And the Reformation is the place where that system uh, broke. The success of Luther's Reformation really had to do very much not just with the theology. People are hungry for this message about God's love, 
but also German nationalism. Now you gotta understand, there's no such thing as a Germany, as a nation in the 16th century as we know it. It was a region of peoples of similar ethnic backgrounds with each region having its own prince. Christianity had come relatively late to Germany compared to Southern Europe. It was also the region that was really seen as the backwoods of Europe. And so for centuries, Germans had been living with an image that they were really barbarians, inferior, not well-educated. And of course, we know who's running the Catholic Church. It's based in Rome. It's more Southern European. So after centuries of feeling like nobody, the sense that Martin Luther could stand up to the establishment made me, a German peasant, proud. Not unlike the pride that the African-American community felt when Martin Luther King and other leaders of the civil rights movement stood up to the racism. Well, that's the feeling that was spreading over much of Germany. Martin Luther was our hero, and we're going to identify with him. This is a chance to really be German and proud of it. And so that explains a lot of his success in Germany. But then there's politics involved, like in everything else. And what happened is that you had a church and state that was uh, closely allied and the society that they were a part of was beginning uh, to disintegrate, to break up. You can, might think of it in the same way that we think about the fall of the Roman Empire. Well, this society was beginning to uh, break down. A lot of reasons for that. Uh, the ones that are usually mentioned in history books are uh, almost constant warfare, 100 years war between the English-speaking peoples and the French-speaking peoples. The plague of the 14th century uh, had huge uh, economic impact and psychological and religious impact. Politically, there were um, two popes and in the in that time period, 1300 to 1500, and then it, at times there were three popes, and since the pope was the sole religious authority for Christendom, uh, authority issues became uh, very, very critical. And in all of this, uh, as this system is beginning to break down, the church, the Roman church, the church with the Roman uh, 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 allegiance, uh, began to, uh, uh, it became difficult for them to survive. Uh, money came hard to come by. Money was hard to come by. And so there were a number of uh, abuses, moral abuses and financial abuses that were, that needed, being, needed to be addressed at that time. The Reformation is one way that some people tried to address that situation. Luther was the first, but there were others. There were three other major traditions that began in that same century. Uh, Luther was the first and the Lutherans. The second was the Reformed tradition, which is primarily uh, out of Switzerland. The most famous person there is John Calvin. So Calvinism is that way of doing church. The third uh, is the Radical Reformation, which is a term that's kind of an umbrella term for uh, uh, a, a group of people who uh, often had a separation of church and state. They, they tried not to reform the church-state system, but they tried to separate the church-state system and, uh, and they were doing this because they wanted to be like the earliest churches. And the earliest churches, New Testament churches, had no real state connection. There was no state that they were part of. The, we most uh, commonly speak of, of that group of people uh, by those who were in the majority in that group of people, and that's the Anabaptists. Uh, um, though there were others, and so that term radical reformation is used. The fourth group that came out of that time uh, was the Church of England, the Anglican Church. In the United States, we speak of the Anglican Church as the Episcopal Church because at the American Revolution, 
the uh, Anglican Church people in the colonies split from the English government and formed their own uh, Anglican Communion Church, which we call uh, the Episcopalian Church. So uh, that's what happened in the 1500s. And it is hard for us to realize how that kind of fracturing of the one religion, the Christianity, which was the one civil religion of Western Europe at the time. It doesn't mean there weren't others there. Of course, uh, uh, Judaism was very active in the West at the time, but Judaism didn't have its hands on the levers of power in civil government. And the church who looked to authority for the pastor in Rome, the Pope, did. But what is happening in the Reformation is that that unity is broken. And by the way, uh, Luther and others always, during their lifetimes, are assuming that someday that unity would be restored. And each one thought that it would be restored according to the lines of their way of doing Christian church. But even if you're not religious, the Reformation is something that has shaped your life. Why? The Reformation embodied a break with church authority. And at least some forms of the Reformation stressed individual interpretation. We have with the Reformation then the beginning of the modern idea of freedom. And in that sense, once people are free to think for themselves, it's no accident that what follows the Reformation are these revolutions in science, these revolutions in the evolution of democracy. In some ways, the Reformation shaped the modern world as we know it. One of the things that set up this Reformation and this great change was technology. They, uh, we generally speak of another overlapping movement with the Reformation, which is the Renaissance. This, uh, Da Vinci and others uh, at that time. And one of the things that that uh, produced was the uh, uh, invention of the printing press, Gutenberg printing press. So Luther is a rather unimportant university professor and preacher and monk in a little town of Wittenberg in Germany. And he nails 95 statements, the 95 theses, to the church door on uh, All Hallows' Eve because he knows people will be coming to church and he wants to start a discussion of the things he's upset about with the nature of the church. Uh, prior to technological changes, that had been about as far as it got. But because somebody could take it down or Perhaps Luther had done it himself, we don't really know. But somebody put it on the printing press. That meant that those words spread far and wide. It was as big a shift in communication as the computer digital age is today. And uh, one of the parallels is that whoever's got the printing press has got the freedom to spread their ideas. Before this, whoever owned the library controlled who got the ideas. So this is what's known as the September Testament. So one of the major movements within uh, the early part of the 16th century was the translation of the Bible, which had largely been a Latin text into vernacular languages. And this is here an early remarkable example. This is the first edition of Martin Luther's translation of the New Testament into the German language, uh, which is significant not only as a Bible, but also as a kind of early unifying text for the German language itself. Uh, this particular example also has wonderful woodcut illustrations. Here uh, we're looking at an example uh, from the book of Revelation. But this is a really important text, and it gives us a sense of how translation of the Bible was really one of the kind of theological decisions that was being made in the early Reformation period.
the fact of the translation is itself unusual. While there were certainly German translations of the Bible before, what's interesting and unique about this is that Luther is translating the New Testament off of a Greek original. So while early German Bibles had been translations of the Latin text, which oft often called the Vulgate, uh, Luther here in 1522 is working off of Erasmus's Greek New Testament that he had just put together in 1516 and then in 1519. And so when we think about the Reformation and the move back to the sources, this here is a physical example of this move back to what was thought to be the original language of the New Testament, which was Greek. There's a whole group of colleagues of mine in the academy who have discovered that Luther may have a lot in common with the Eastern Orthodox churches. Now by Eastern Orthodox churches, I'm thinking of like the Russian Orthodox church, the Greek Orthodox church, the churches of Africa, the ancient African churches like in Ethiopia. You see, they have a view of salvation that's different from we in the West. They call it deification. It goes like this. God became man so man could become like God. You see, when Jesus took on human flesh, he had a flesh like you and me. And that means we've got this little spark of divinity in us. And then Christian life is all about letting that divinity come out and take over. Well, of course, that's a problem for most Protestant churches. But the latest insight is, you know, when Luther's talking about God's love, he talks something like that. Here's his version. Luther says that when you come to faith, it's not just like God tells you you're okay. Jesus comes and lives with you, like a marriage. Christian life is like a marriage to Jesus. And this is a kind of a marriage before they had prenuptial agreements. It's community property. All that belongs to Jesus is yours, and all that belongs to you is now his. That's why he had to go to the cross. He got the bum deal on this marriage now. He took all our sin. But now all of his qualities are ours. Can you see the similarity now to the Eastern Church? Well, that's what the leaders of both these churches, the Lutheran Church and these Eastern Churches, the Greek and Russian Orthodox, are seeing. Maybe we're not so far apart. Maybe Luther can help us to see that we really are one church after all, that the Reformation doesn't divide us. Yet Luther's views on other faiths remain complex, troubling. You can't deal with Luther if you don't deal with the charges of anti-Semitism. So let's talk about that. There's no question, Hitler used writings from Luther to justify what he did during the Hol Holocaust to get German support, popular German support. And there's one article that Luther writes horrible things about the Jews in terms of advocating their censure, their political persecution. That's what Hitler used. But what a lot of historians don't tell you or don't know is, early in his career, Luther stuck his neck out for the Jewish community. When the Reformation's just beginning, and he's starting to get some German princes to follow him, he writes a treatise called in English that Jesus Christ was born a Jew, where he advocates for Jewish rights, where he pleads with these princes who are now his followers to actually make sure Jews get equal rights. Why this change? Well, this is so typical of Luther. I think he did the right thing early on, but then at least he heard rumors that these newly liberated Jews and their Jewish leaders were proselytizing some of the lapsed Catholics. Luther also advocated the translation of the Muslim holy book, the Quran, while criticizing Islam, like Judaism and Catholicism, for teachings that only good works bring salvation, as the cracks in Christianity widened with devastating consequences. The historians usually close the era of the Reformation with the end of the Thirty Years' War, which ended in 1648. The Thirty Years' War began as a, as a uh, struggle between Catholic forces and Protestant forces, primarily in Germany. It went on for 30 years and it pulled into, its, uh, into that war persons from all over Europe. At the end, there's a kind of stalemate. They realize there's not going to be any uh, synthesis or uh, there's not going to be any clear winners. 
to, to this. So f from there on, uh, there's really a, a pretty settled understanding that uh, we're going to have to live with these Protestants and we Protestants are going to have to live with these Catholics from now on. Now that doesn't mean that they were through fighting each other, uh, but it does mean that, that it became clearer that from now on uh, wars between nations were going to be more about uh, political aspects than they would be about religious aspects. Religion continues to be used as a factor in calling people to war and so on, but uh, persons after this are usually fighting more for England or France than they are for Protestantism or Catholicism uh, after that time. So in that sense, the Reformation goes on. It is, uh, it's worth saying that a common conclusion that uh, the Reformation historians give, that is, consequence of the Reformation is, that there came to be an understanding that Reformation or critique and improvement of the Christian church was an ongoing project. Prior to the Reformation, the assumption was that uh, the church as we have it is basically uh, an authority which cannot be challenged. That doesn't mean that there weren't uh, persons in the Catholic Church who were striving to reform their community from within, but it, but it did mean that the uh, authority that was vested in the hierarchy uh, was basically unchallenged. If it were challenged, those who challenged it might easily find themselves on the outside, both of, uh, of the civil society and the religious society. Common word would be heretics. What would Luther think about what's going on today? Well, it depends on the context. <laughs> I can't speak for what Luther would say in every situation. I think certainly there would be disappointment at one level, at least with the church in the West, 